Today's episode of the Bill Simmons Podcast with world champion Draymond Green is brought to you by SeatGeek, our presenting sponsor and our favorite app for buying and selling tickets for sports and music. Go to SeatGeek.com slash BS to start using SeatGeek in time for the NHL playoffs or the NBA playoffs. Don't forget to download the free SeatGeek app and our promo code BS. SeatGeek sends you $20 upon your first purchase. We're also brought to you by HBO Now, the home of After the Thrones. The Ringer's post-game show for Game of the Thrones starring Andy Greenwald and Chris Ryan. Game of Thrones launches Sunday, April 24th. After the Thrones launches shortly after, exclusively on HBO Now. Sign up for The Ringer's awesome newsletter at theringer.com as well. We're getting awesome reviews. Today we did an all-NBA one. That was great. Just sign up. For God's sakes, I don't ask you for much. The podcast is free. Please do it. And we're off. Yeah. Clear enough for you. Yeah, right. Well, he's a one time <laughs> champion. Yeah. He's part of a record setting team that won 73 games in one season. I did not think that was possible. I did not think a lot of things this guy w- is doing was possible. Draymond Green, how are you? I'm good, good. How about you? Congratulations. Um, Thank you. Steve Kerr was on my podcast. I'm going to say four years ago, back when he was a media guy, before he became uh, the coach of a champion and a 7-3 win team. And he was saying he thought this was impossible. And he said that the only reason they won 72 games was because Michael was wired the way he was. And there were just eight to nine games when you should lose because of the schedule and you just don't because you have Michael Jordan on your team and he's a maniac. So how did you guys do this? Um, I mean... You know, he actually told us last night after the game, like, yeah, guys, I'm going to be honest with you, this record may never be broken. Um, when we won 72, like, I thought this record, it would never be broken. And here we are sitting here, and we just broke the record. And I'm not sure. I mean, I know we, you know, we have a couple guys that, we, I mean, I, honestly, we have a team full of competitors. You know, when you really break down our roster, you're talking to Sean Livingston, who doctors tried to amputate his leg. Right. You know, and should have never played basketball again. Yet he beat the odds, you know, and made it back and, you know, as a key contributor to our team. You're talking to Fess Zeely, who didn't start playing basketball until he was 19 years old. He's not supposed to be in the NBA. You know, you're talking to a Steph Curry, who – Went to Davidson and had one Division One basketball offer, and nobody gave him a shot. You know, he's too small. He's not quick enough. He's not strong enough. He's not big enough. Like all this stuff. I'm talking to a guy like myself, who no one gave a chance. A Clay Thompson, who barely was recruited. You know, had three Division One schools recruiting him out. When you look at our roster. It's made up of guys who's overcome odds, you know, and who's continued to fight no matter what situation was placed in front of them. And that's the makeup of this team, and that's why we're able to accomplish something of this of this magnitude because no matter what the situation is, we're always fighting to overcome those odds. And we have that chip on our shoulder as individuals which make it a lot easier to have it as a team because you got a group full of individuals that have a chip on their shoulder. A collective chip on the shoulder. I like it. Like Jordan was basically, you know, he just, there were nights when he wouldn't let them news, lose. And I watched you guys this year. And even though it wasn't just a singular guy that was imposing his will like that, it's almost seemed like people would take turns and collectively a lot of it came from you and Steph. And like, for instance, when you were in Boston, I think in December, um, and I thought the Celtics should have won that game. And you, Steph was off that night, Warriors not playing that well, you're in the middle of a road trip, and you just took the game personally for whatever reason you wouldn't lose. And then there are other nights where Steph did that. Well, how many times in this season do you say, you probably shouldn't have won the game, but you guys just wouldn't let the, let yourselves lose? And when I when I look back on on this regular season, um, you know I there's like you said you have the Boston game, you have the Milwaukee game at home, yeah, you have the OKC game where Steph hit the, the 
bomb from 50 feet right. to win the game. That we should have had no business winning that game. Saturday, Memphis. You know, um, huh? The Memphis game on uh, over the weekend, that's definitely one of them. Absolutely. The, the Memphis game, for sure. We had no business winning that game. I say that's four right off the top of the head. The Nets, you needed uh, you needed Brooke Lopez to miss that little three footer, and uh, Iguodala hit the big three, but right before that, but that was another one you pulled out. That's five. Absolutely. Like when I when when I really look at this season, there's at least ten to thirteen of those games that we had no business winning. Right. And so, somehow we found a way. So how many did you blow? Like I, I thought the Celtics in '86 were the best team I ever saw. They went sixty-seven and fifteen. And if you look at some of the games they lost, they just blew a bunch of dumb games to bad teams. Like, it's amazing. I think they lost 10 games to, you know, 500 or below teams. You guys didn't really seem to blow any dumb games, or am I not remembering one? I think um, as well as they played, we, we blew the Minnesota game last week. Oh, yeah, you're right. You should have won that regulation. I agree with that. They won the OT, yeah. though. They played yeah, we, well in the OT. They did. We blew that game. I think we had a four-point lead with, like, two minutes to go or something like that. And usually we're able to build on that or at least hold on to it. We blew that game. Other than that, I don't really think we really blew any games. I mean, we just, right. like, like, the Lakers came out and just beat the crap out of us. <laughs> right. San Antonio at San Antonio, they they, just, they, they beat us. Yeah. Um, Detroit, at Detroit, they just beat us. I don't think we really – blew any games other than the Minnesota game. Right. Because usually teams are going to let and, up. They're going to take games for granted. The Lakers game was really the was, only atrocious loss that you had this season. Yeah, it was, it was such a weird feeling, too, because I'm, I'm so used to us winning those games. Yeah. It's like four-point lead. When I look up and I'm like, oh, we got to lead. Like, oh, that's, that's like clockwork. That's game. Right. And when we lost that game, I couldn't believe it. Like, wow, we never lose games like that. You know, so I'm, I was, we blew that one for sure. I'm a I'm a huge Patriots fan, obviously. And uh, when they went 16 and 0 in 2007, about I would say around week eight, maybe week nine, every game became a playoff game, and it was the biggest game of the season for the other team. And they just had to carry that week after week after week. I actually thought it wore them down. Why didn't you guys wear down during this during this whole run? You know, I think there's uh, there's several reasons why. Number one, like like you spoke at the beginning, every night is not just Steph carrying the load. You yep. know, every night is not just you know Draymond had a good game and took over this game, or all of a sudden it's Clay caught fire. Like it's it's something it's someone different every night. Like you, I can look at most of our, our games this year, and I can honestly say there's at least twelve of our guys that won us that game. Yeah. And there's not there's not many teams that can say that. You know, when you look at your roster and say, all right. Marty Space won us that game. You know, you look at it and say, Brandon Rush won us that game. Not many teams can say that. Yeah. You know, you look at it, usually it's like, all right, maybe four guys won us a game. But most of the times it was one or two guys. Our team, some, just about everybody won us a game this year. Right. And that's, I think that's a huge part of the reason that we don't wear down because everything we do, we do it collectively. And the and they manage the minutes pretty nice with you. I saw some. I was reading something this week about how many times Jordan played forty minutes or more during that ninety five ninety six season. I think Steph only did it four times. I thought that was really smart. Just in general, it seems like teams think about the schedule in a in a much more intelligent way. But at the same time, like. You had a brutal road trip, you know, during that streak. And I thought for sure you are going to blow one of those games in the streak. When did you guys, when did 25, well, you didn't know you were going to 25 and 0, but when did that undefeated streak really, when did you really start thinking about it? You know, I think after, when, when we, um, I think the 
Clippers was like game 11 or 12 or something like that. Yeah. 13, maybe. I went to that game. And, yeah, that was a good one. Yeah, that was a good one. And when we came, yeah, when we came back and won that game, I think we were down 24 in the first quarter or second quarter or something like that. Yeah. And when we came back and won that game, it was like, okay, let's see how long we can ride this streak out. And then uh, being, you know, once you win a game like that, now everybody's looking like, well, that was the game they were supposed to lose. So you, you st- all the numbers start coming out of best start in NBA history, best start in major sport, you know, out of four major sport history. You know, you, you start seeing all that stuff, and then you start to try to go for it. Yeah. You know, so – I'd say after that Clipper game was when we really looked at the streak and said, wow, all right, well, let's see how long we can ride this out. And also it probably helped that you guys win the title and then everyone spends the whole summer and off season shitting on the fact that everybody was you played was injured and here comes San Antonio, has LaMarcus Aldridge, and Cleveland's going to be better. And it was like you had no chance to go back to back. I'm, that must have been motivating. 100%. You know, and um, we're already a, a pretty self-motivated group anyway. Yeah. You know, but um, when you're every day, you look up and there's someone else saying this or someone else saying that. So they didn't play such and such. They didn't play this person. It's like, really? <laughs> right. Okay. You know, so that allows you, you know, to where – when you're coming back from a from a championship season, the one thing a lot of former champions told me was that it's so hard to start the regular season again because the last time you played together, the last time you were on the court together, you were in game six or whatever game it was that you ended the final. We were, for us, it was game six. You were in game six of the NBA final. How did you come back in the regular season three months later? And try to match that intensity level you can't yeah it, like it it doesn't it doesn't live up to what you what you just left and so a lot of guys told me that that was the tough part well when you just finished game six of the finals and everybody's saying oh that that championship is lucky you know that they didn't play such stuff. they didn't do this they're not really that good da, da, da. It, it, it fuels you so it allows you to make game one feel like a playoff game because now you're out to achieve more. So the best thing that happened to you guys yeah. was San Antonio signing LaMarcus Aldridge because then everyone just like, oh, San Antonio, oh, my God, they did it again, and and then nobody's talking about you. That was a good thing, I think. I think that was, I think that was good for us because, yeah. um, number one, we came into the season like, not the favorite anymore. Um, they kind of, they kind of took pressure off us in a yeah, way. Yeah, I would agree. You also didn't, you know, Pat Riley. I was, I wrote about this whole. I have a whole chapter about this in my basketball book about Pat Riley called it the disease of me, where you win something good happens with a basketball team. You win the title. Everybody sacrifices to win that title. But then you win it, and then everybody's like, okay, man, all right, I'm ready for more minutes. I'm ready to get paid more. I want more shots. And you just want more, more, more. But that didn't happen with you guys at all. So why? Well, I think when you look at, you know, stuff like that, I think that's usually based on who your stars are. Yeah. Who's your core? You know, who's your core group of guys? And when you look at that for us, Steph is one of the most humble human beings you're ever going to meet. You know, Clay, he's humble. He doesn't care about anything <laughs> but winning. Like, now, Clay cares about his shots, but right. it doesn't matter that he cares about his shots because that's what he do for us. Like, yeah. So, you don't have to come out like, oh, I need to get more shots. No, you're going to get them anyway because that's what we need you to do. Right. You know, um, uh, Harrison, who was in a contract year, you know, who couldn't reach an, you know, an agreement on an extension, who can come out and say, oh, I need to do this, I need to do that. 
it's not his personality. Like, he's not that type of guy. You know, um, and Andre Iguodala, who's coming off a of finals MVP, isn't coming back in saying, oh, I need to start now. Like, yeah. he's comfortable with what he brings to this team. And so, you know, myself, taking less money so we can continue to build, you know, so we can make sure this thing stay together. That's the type of guys that you have. And so I think that's also a credit to our front office, to the type of guys that they built this team on, you know, that they put in place. You know, everybody's okay with their role, and we're not trying to come out and say, hey, I need I need this, I need that, I need to do more of this, more of that. Because one thing we all know is that if you win – all the other stuff will take care of itself. Right. You know, the things that guys worry about trying to go chase and end up losing it because of it, they don't get because they don't win. But if you win, <laughs> all that stuff take care of itself anyway. Let me ask you about Steph. Because, you know, Steph and David Lee were on my podcast a million years ago. And Steph is a very unassuming guy. You know, you would you would never... Mm-hmm. I thought he was, you know, one of the best shooters I've ever seen. I thought he was going to be a very good pro. I never expected this to happen. But when you meet him, as you said, very humble, unassuming guy. And yet over the last two years, especially this year, got a little bit of an FU edge to him. A little bit of, it's almost like you injected a little bit of your DNA into him. Um, was that, how much of that is you and how much is that just him being like, you know what, I'm just great at this and I can't help myself? Um, well, you know, a part of that is <clears throat> a part of that is him. You know, he's just grown into himself. You know, with me being the, the vocal leader on this team, I think, you know, when you, when you put yourself in the leader category, if you can't impose some of your personality, some of your personality on guys, yeah, you know, then then what type of leader are you? You know, if if you can't put some of you in someone else. Because yeah. at the end of the day, leading someone is taking them in the direction that you're going, taking them in the direction that you want to go. And so you have to be able to impose some of yourself on someone that you're leading. You know, if you're running a company, it's hard. <clears throat> you see a lot of CEOs or, you know, someone who's managing a company get upset with people that's working with them. Because they feel like they're not following their lead. They feel like they don't have that same work ethic. They feel like, you know, what they're trying to accomplish, this person isn't helping. And they're not picking up on what they're trying to show them. And so, you know, it's, I think, you know, he probably fed off of, you know, the way I am a little bit. But at the same time, you're not that great just feeding off someone. Yeah. Like, he's, he's great, you know, and maybe it, you know, maybe it took someone like myself being around him every day for him to just go with it and run with it. Right. But I can't necessarily take credit for what he's grown into because that also comes with all the hard work that he puts in. You know, he's yeah. so confident in everything that he does simply because of the work that he put in. And so, you know, I think it all goes hand in hand for sure. I think that unquestionably you guys feed off each other as well as any uh, any two first team All NBA guys that I've ever <laughs> seen. I think Jordan and Pippen got there when Jordan came back from baseball. Um, they just went to another level and everything. It was like they were a tandem. It was like Pippen became like this mirror image of Jordan in a lot of ways, and they just made each other better. And I definitely feel that way when I watch watch YouTube. But at the same time, like I keep going back to that game seven you lost to the Clippers when we had no idea that Steph was going to become this yet. We knew he was going to be really good. Um, I went to that game. Chris Paul beat the shit out of him for four quarters. He committed 120 fouls on him in that game. And Steph kept coming back and fighting and trying to get his shot and just fending for whatever reason. They just weren't calling fouls at all in that game. 
And I thought that was the most important game of, of his career for what kind of ensued. Am I right or am I wrong? No, no, I think I think you're definitely right. Um, you know, after we lost that game, like his his whole mentality was different. You know, it was kind of like I think that's what really finally brought him out. You know, Chris is a guy who Steph grew up working out with, who was kind of like, you know, a, a big brother to him, kind of. And I think at that point, you know, it's kind of like that point where you get tired of, you know, your older brother and you're going to go do something about it. Right. And I think that game right there, that series, was like that point of where it was like, okay, now I'm going to show you what, who I really am. Now I'm going to show you what I'm made of. And from that point on, <laughs> he's taking – he's like Steph's taking the league over yeah. since then. And it's um, it's incredible, you know, to watch from where he's come from that game seven to where he's at now. It's it's amazing. And I think that I think that definitely had a part to – had a role in – play the role in where he's at now for sure 100 percent. and he's that type of competitor you know he's yeah i think that was failure for him you no know, some people with failure they they fold and some people with failure they use it to fuel him and i think it fueled him what did you take away from that game because you you also made a big leap the following season too that game right there showed me i really belong you know not only that game, that series, but really that game seven showed me that you know, I think we all have a, you know, we all reach a point where it's like, okay, you know, you, you understand I can do this. Like, and when I left game seven of that series, I told my boys, I said, they done messed up. So they just showed, they didn't let me figure out that I can do the same thing I've done at every level, level at this level. I said they done messed up. It's time I'm about to take it to another level. That's what that game showed me. Uh, I I think it was your rookie year. I was on TV, and you guys were in the playoffs. It was one of the first times Steph got really hot in the national stage uh, against the Spurs. And I was talking about how uh, the Warriors, nobody else could shoot threes on the Warriors. And I, I said something about how you couldn't shoot threes. And you got mad. You tweeted at me at, about it. And I remember thinking, like, I like this guy. This guy took it. Like, you were shooting, like, 28% when I said you couldn't shoot threes, but you took it personally. I was like, I'm going to keep an eye on this guy. I like this guy. Do you remember that? <laughs> I do remember that. I'll tell you exactly what it was. First off, I was shooting 28% from the field. I was shooting, like, 17% from three. Okay. <laughs> first off. <laughs> so that's the first part. Uh, the second part, I remember you tweeted, um... You said something about no one else can shoot threes. And then you said, does Draymond Green not realize he can shoot? He's open for a reason. Oh, I remember that. Okay. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, okay. So I, so I tweeted back. Yeah. And, and, and I said, all right, I'm going to show him and everybody else I can shoot. And, you know, stuff like that has always fueled me. You yeah. Know, because it's like, all right, you know. People are going to always doubt you, and they're going to always do this. But it's it's always fueled me. You know, it's funny because I was just watching Kobe last night, and I, with with when he finished, you know, at the end of his press conference, he he thanked the media and he said, "You guys don't understand what y'all do for the game. You know, whether we hate it or not, sometimes whether it's a good article you write, whether it's a bad article, sometimes it helps players and." Those things right there help me because it makes me work and it shows me what I need to work on. Okay, well, this is, you know, what they're saying about me. Let me go work on this and turn this weakness into one of my strengths. And so that right there has helped me become the shooter that I've become. Now, I'm not a shooter. I can make shots, but, you know, it's helped me get to this point. And so... So I get credit. I thank you for that. You thank know, because you. Because it's like, I mean, I, I thought I could shoot then, and my percentage just wasn't saying it. And so it made me get in the gym and continue to work. But without that tweet, do I even realize how bad of a shooter I am? Like, sometimes you get so caught up and lost and feeling yourself that 
You don't even realize the reality. Well, I have so, someone else you should thank. I think we all go through that. I think you should also thank Jalen Rose because he was, when we were watching those games in the little TV room with all the TVs, he was the one screaming that you were open for a reason, and I finally tweeted it. So you thank him as well. <laughs> so he was the other one. That's a Jalen phrase. Jalen loves yelling that people are open for a reason. On your team, uh, nobody is ever open for a reason because everybody can shoot uh, long range except for Bogut. I, I've, I've, you guys have basically reinvented basketball. I mean, there's been pieces of it. The Suns push people along. I think the Spurs did too. But you made 13 threes a game this season. And, you know, it just doesn't make sense over 82 games. You would think there would be 15 or 16 times a season when people just go cold. And it just it doesn't happen with you guys. Do you, do you guys even think about that anymore? You know, um, I think there's really one game this season where we were just cold, couldn't hit anything, and that was the Lakers. I think we ended four for 30 from three or something like that. Yeah, that was it. And, like, that's other than that, that's the only game I can really remember where we were just cold, cold, cold. What? You know, when we have nights where they're, they aren't falling at the rate that they usually fall, we'll say, okay, you know, let's get to the hole a couple times and then work our way back out. Right. You know, because the game has always been played, and Coach Izzo even taught me this, the game is always usually played outside in. I mean, inside and out. Yeah. So we kind of play outside in. And, you know, Coach Curl will tell us sometimes, hey, we need to get the ball to the post. Even if it's not the score – Get the ball to the post because you're kind of breaking the defense a little bit. And then we start kicking back out. But, you know, we don't really think go into it thinking about what we're going to do if these shots fall. We just kind of go as the game goes. I think we've gotten to a point now where we know each other so well that it's like, all right, can look, just look at each other and realize what we need to do. And yeah. that's, I think, you know, when I look at the Spurs' dominance, I understand now why they've been so dominant for so long because those guys have been together for so long. And, you know, we've been together for four years now and understanding that we already have of each other. Damn. Like, I think this is Tony's 15th year, which means I think what's this, Timmy's 20th year, 19th year? Yeah, 19th, Something I like think. that. Yeah. Uh, Ginobili, what, 16th or 17th year? I think Ginobili and Parker are 15 and Duncan's like 19. Okay. And, and so you look at that, like just think about what you were doing 15 years ago. Right. <laughs> They've been playing together that long. Like that's incredible. Like just imagine if you had a a podcast with someone for 15 years straight, and y'all have talked for nine months of the year every day for 15 years straight. They'd be tired of me. Like. You you would you would never talk over each other or anything. Like it'll just be like clockwork. Well, wasn't that? So I understand why they've been so dominant for so long, and that's kind of where we're going to be. And that's you know I feel it heading that way. Hold on, I have a big question coming up. But first, we got to talk about stamps.com. Why would you waste 20 minutes finding a parking space outside a pack post office than stand in a line that's way too long? You wouldn't have to do that if you're Draymond Green. But you do have to do it if you're a normal person. Uh, only you don't. You don't have to do it to yourself. Here's an idea. Use stamps.com at stamps.com. Buy and print official U.S. postage for any letter or package using your own computer and printer. All you have to do is sign up for stamps.com right now. Use the promo code BS. You get a four-week trial plus a $110 bonus offer that includes postage and a digital scale. This is what the Sixers used in the mail the 2015-16 NBA season, Stamps.com. Uh, go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in BS. That's Stamps.com, enter BS. And since we're here, I want to talk about Simply Safe. Here's the thing. Studies show that security systems deter burglars. This is a good thing. You want to deter burglars. So if you, if you already have a security system, that's great. But if you don't... Well, think about it. If you're a burglar, where are you going to look? You're going to look for the place that doesn't have the security system. Let me recommend a brilliant security system that my buddies at Simply Safe built. It's ridiculously smart. Its sensors will protect every point of access to your home. 
It's really almost the, the Draymond Green of, of home defense. It's ridiculously smart. Its sensors will protect every point of access. And if a burglar so much as tries to break in, an ear-shattering siren will let him know or her know. But it doesn't, burglars can be a, a male, a female, you just don't know, but, but they're bad. They're bad for your house. And that ear-shattering siren will let you know, let them know that police are already on the way. Best of all, Simply Safe's 24-7 monitoring is just $14.99 a month. They'll never lock you into a long-term contract. You even get a 60-day money-back guarantee. There's no reason not to try it. Go with the only home security system I trust, Simply Safe, by going to simplysafebill.com. Go there right now. You save an extra 10%. Simplysafebill.com. And now, the big question. Well, I mean, the biggest thing that happened for you guys was that there was so much talk about the Clay Thompson, Clay Thompson and Kevin Love, and that whole is it going to happen? Is it not going to happen? And no, but I didn't know what was true, what was not true. I was thinking, as I was watching it unfold, of course they should trade Clay Thompson for Kevin Love. Kevin Love is one of the ten best players in the league, and yet if you make that trade, none of this happens. And as you're watching that just from afar. Are you praying that trade doesn't happen? Not only is it bad for the team, but it would have been bad for you. You lose minutes. You know, I, I didn't want that trade to happen at all. I thought it was crazy that we were thinking about it. I mean, I'm going to be wrong. Like, Kevin Love's a good player, a really good player. But I just didn't think, like, like when you have a backcourt like Clay and Steph, you don't, you don't break that up in, in the third, going into the third year of one of those guys career like that's just something that you you just don't do right and so I didn't want it to happen for that reason you know I knew that we were already trending the head into the right direction and to be honest with you there's a possibility that I would have just been a throw in in that trade so who even knows where my career goes from there you know like sometimes it works out for a throw in sometimes you don't get a shot right you know when you look at a Shannon Brown for instance, a guy who's closer to me, Michigan State, he was a throw in in the Lakers deal. All of, two championships later, ten years later in the career, it worked out. But it don't work out for everyone that's a throw in. Like and so it's, it's a slippery slope. And who like I know this would have never happened. Where we're at now, obviously, but like for myself, I don't know where I would be. Like, I'll tell you, I'll be out the league. High possibility because when you're throwing, you sometimes just don't get a chance. I don't think you'd be out of the league, but I don't think you would have had as fun of a time in Minnesota the last couple of years. I'm positive of that one. I think both on and off I, the I'm court, it would have been a it would have been a loss. Yeah, <laughs> on and off the court, I think you lose <laughs> both ways on that one. By the way, that's one of the things I've enjoyed about you. I've watched a ton of Warriors games this season, partly because. Uh, you guys are just so much fun to watch, but also I'm on the West Coast, and you know my choices were you guys, Sacramento, or the Lakers, or the Clippers, so I can't watch anymore. So uh, I was usually gravitating to you, but it seems like I, this is a theory. I might be wrong. I'm guessing. It seems like you know who's at the game, and you know what celebrities are around, and you kind of establish a little back and forth with them, even if it's just eye contact. Like if Jay Z's at the game and he's in the front row. You know this. Am I correct? Absolutely. You know, growing up in Saginaw, I was always taught to always be aware of your surroundings. I always know who you have around you. And so that's something that I always pay attention to. You know, I'm – I even – in when I was in college, you know, like you go to these visiting arenas and, like, your coaches – Coaches don't ever say anything to me about it, but it's like an unwritten rule. You don't, you know, you don't talk to the other people's fans. You don't look in the crowd. Like that's kind of an unwritten rule in sports, really. Um, but definitely basketball. Um, and I've never really followed that rule. Like I go up to <laughs> to other teams' crowd and talk to their student sections and talk junk to them, and they'll talk junk and tell me I was I sucked, and I go up to them and. Tell them, like, you just made it bad for the person guarding me today. <laughs> and so, you know, that's kind of where I was at in college. And then you get to the league and, like, you see a Jay-Z sitting in the front row or Beyonce or, you know, Floyd Mayweather, you know. And it's just like, wow. Like, All right, here we go. So I, it, I, I just I always talk back and forth. You know, 
when we're playing the Clippers, uh, I've actually started to build a relationship with Anthony Anderson. <laughs> and yeah. He's a big time Clippers fan. So I have back and forth with him the entire game when we're playing in, when we're playing the Clippers. He'll be he'll text me before the game like, "Hey, you know I'll be there. I'm coming for you." Like, and I text him back like, "Y'all have a shot." <laughs> so like we, and we have fun with that. And right. so it's you know it's one thing about it's funny too you know because there's a whole, there's a saying and I think it's so true. All rappers want to play basketball and like all basketball players want to rap yeah and so it's you kind of just you know mess with mess with those relationships a little bit you know while you're on the course so i always know who's around all well, the time well you guys uh this season you became the hottest ticket in 20 years i mean i was there for the the entire mj bull run in the in the mid 90s and we had celtic season tickets and when they came in it was it was important, especially if your team sucked. Like this was the the two times a year, some unbelievable team would come in, and we got to watch real basketball. And there were so many fans of the of the Bulls that would be there, and there was just kind of electricity in the crowd. People would show up before the games, you know, well before to watch the warm ups and things like that. You guys took that to another level. When did you realize that you would become kind of the same type of traveling circus that that Bulls team was? You know, our fans started, I mean, we've always had a few fans traveling with us, but, like, this went to a completely different level. And I think last year, you know, it kind of got to a point where it's like, all right, you know, we're getting a good turnaround on the road. Yeah. Then all of a sudden this year, like, like I said, everything went to another level during that winning streak. Like, you know, you show up to these hotels at – um two o'clock in the morning and you know there'd be 15 people outside for autograph and then they got to they got to a point where you know we're showing up to hotels and and like it's two, 150 people out 200 people outside at two in the morning right yelling <laughs> and it's like yo are you kidding me like what 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 is up with this and so Everything went to another level during the winning streak. I say probably halfway through it, because then it became not only is our fans traveling with us, but everybody want to see when we're going to lose that first game. Everybody want to see who's going to be that team to beat us. Right. And it just became a zoo. Not to mention Steph's celebrity went has gone to a completely different level, and that's made a huge difference as well. Yeah, he, as we talked before, Steph is the one of the most humble superstars we ever had. It is weird, like he's so popular now. I just I don't understand. It's gonna be so hard for him to to kind of maintain that that humility. But I guess that's why he has people like you in his life, right? You still bust his balls all the time. Okay, good, <laughs> good. all the time. But you know, uh, Steph, he has a great family. Um, when you're talking family as in his family that he's built, you know, with his wife and kids, but also, you know, a great support system from his mom and his dad, you know, that I never really, I never worry about Steph Waver, although at the end of the day, still a human. Yeah. And so you're always going to have those moments where you have to pinch yourself and say, hey, let me continue to be me. You know, let me not let this change me because it's happened to so many people, like, you know, when everything just changes like that, I mean, in some ways it forces you to change. You, But I think he'll always stay as closest to who he's always been as possible. And like I said, he's going to change. You know, you have to change some. Like, that just comes with it. But he'll always be true to who he is as a person. I'm and sure, that's what's most important. I'm sure things have changed for you. Um, one thing I was thinking though was you're you're Michigan State. You were there four years. You had a lot of success, and that means that you know you got some Magic Johnson time. I'm sure maybe there was a Magic Johnson text or two, maybe a hug and all that stuff. But but now, 
Now you're a successful MBA Michigan State graduate, which pushes you to a whole never, another level on the Magic Johnson scale. Um, how much in your life is Magic Johnson? You know, it's always it's always great to have a relationship with a guy like Magic, you know, who's been through so much um, basketball-wise and celebrity-wise, life-wise, um, and now business-wise. That you know, he's someone that you can you can always call for pretty much anything because he's been through so much that he can almost give you advice on anything you're going through. And that's pretty incredible, you know, because not many people can say they have that. And so it's it's a blessing, you know, to be able to call on a guy like that. You know, that's why um, That's isn't that so one of the best that... need to make sure they go to Michigan State. Yeah, I was going to say, that's one of the best Michigan State perks. They should put that in, like, the brochure and stuff. If you do well in the basketball it team, is, you get to have Magic Johnson in your life. He'll give you advice on things. It is, de- it is definitely a great perk, that's for sure. Hey, the biggest rap Not on... many people can say that they got Magic Johnson in their life. <laughs> the biggest rap on you in college, you had two. Well, you went way too late in the draft. It was stupid when it was happening. I thought you were going to go in the uh, last half of the first round. But... People said you're an inch and a half too short, and they said you weren't in good enough shape. Why weren't you in good enough shape in college? You know, I think um, coming out of high school, I was in terrible shape. And when I got to college, I got in better shape. And the better was, you know, I was so far behind. I was so far behind that. I thought I was in good shape until I got to the NBA and I realized what good shape really was. And yeah. so, you know, it was never, oh, you're not working, you know, but it's kind of like the old saying, if you knew better, you do better. I think when I, when I knew better, I started to do better. But from where I came from high school to where I was at in college, if you saw me in high school, you'd be like, wow, you were in good shape in college. Yeah, but it just doesn't compare to where I am now, and you know you start to learn more. You know, I was t- it was funny. I think it was after my sophomore season. I ran up and coach this Austin, and, I, and you know people would laugh at me for this. I was so excited, like so excited. I went and coach this office. I had did some cardio that morning, and I went and coach this office. I said, Coach, Coach, you never believe what happened to me today. He was like, what? What happened? He excited. I said, Coach, I, I caught a second win. And he was like, what? <laughs> I said, Coach, I caught a second win. Like, I was doing my cardio, and I got super tired. And I just pushed through it. And all of a sudden, I wasn't tired no more. And he just started laughing at me. But I, I never knew I had a second win because I never pushed myself that far. Like, and I, so it was just one of, like, I never had an idea that if I just continued to go, that I catch a second win. And there you I go. I never knew it. And so that, that was just one of those things where it's like, all right, I figured that out. And I started to use that. Once I got to the NBA, so you realize how how good a shape you have to be in. Number one, I think one of the things that really forced me to get in shape in better shape in the NBA too is because the schedule is so long that I – dealt with bad knee tendonitis my rookie year. And I didn't want to go through that again. So it showed me that I wasn't in good enough shape to where I thought I was in good enough shape. When uh when did you realize you could guard pretty much anyone over six foot four? Um, you know, my rookie year you know, it was um I, I knew I knew that in order for me to stay on the floor, I had to defend. And so, you know, I, I started to take defense so serious that I'm like, I got to do this, I got to do it. And when I really put my mind up to it, to, to really do it and focus on it, I realized, like, all right, well, hey, I, I can guard this dude. And so then the next guy would come along, and I'm like, all right, 
I can guard this dude. Like, I can guard him too. And so it's just like offense. You start to get a certain confidence of, like, I think the, the person with the highest confidence offensively in the NBA is Steph Curry by far, other than Kobe. No. <laughs> Steph Curry. Like, he can miss 10 shots in a row, and he may, he may shoot the next three from 35-plus feet. Like, that confidence – that confidence is that confidence is that confidence is hard to hard to come by. Right. And like that's kinda of where my confidence is defensively. Like, I think I can stop anyone. But that was kinda of, it started my rookie year where when I started to take defense so seriously because I knew it was something that I had to do in order to make it. That it was like, Okay, I can guard him, I can guard him, I can guard him. All right, well, I kind of got that confidence for where I can guard anyone. Um, I know you have to go, and I left some stuff on the table for the next podcast that we do, which will be at some point in the playoffs because I'm, I'm forcing you to come back because I enjoyed this. But I'll be back for sure. I wanted to mention one thing. I just want you to think about this as you head in the playoffs. I'm a diehard Patriot fan. We went 16-0 and in the regular season. It was incredible. We lost the Super Bowl. Guess what? Guess how many times I've I've – Talk to my buddies about the time that my football team went 16 and 0. Zero. So you got to win the title Zero. now. You just have to. You have to finish it. Those are the stakes. Absolutely. That's it. You guys 100%. have a chance. You have the chance to be immortal. This is it. It's all sitting there. You need 16 wins. Immortality. No doubt about it. And you know that's that's the plan. You know, uh, come out here and. <laughs> really do what we have to do in these playoffs and and win the title. Because at the end of the day, I've stated it before. You know, as, as bad as I wanted to win uh, the 73 game, it means absolutely nothing if you don't win the NBA title. You know, I told them uh, the other night, I said they were, we were talking about it uh, in the media. And I said, uh, no, matter of fact, it was a couple of days ago after practice. And they were asking me about it after we won 72. And I said, well, you know, when you, when you go to Chicago and you look up and see them banners, there's no banner with just like 72 and seventy two and 10 all by itself. Right. The championship banner says 72 and 10. I'm pretty sure if they didn't win the championship, you wouldn't see 72 and 10 in their gym. So we got to finish the deal. Well, if you need motivation, I can mail you my 16-0 Patriots t-shirt that I have from 2007. If you guys want to hang that in the locker room, I'm happy to do that. You guys can stare at it. You know what? <laughs> I think as much junk as I talk, that's enough motivation for me. Yeah. When we don't, I'll never hear the end of it. <laughs> I Listen, I've had some great wins as a Boston fan and some bad losses. When they lost that Giants game to go 18-1, and that was way, way up there, and I still haven't gotten over it. So, yeah, you got to finish it. You have a great team. It's a once-in-a-lifetime team. Uh, good luck. Please come back uh, later in the playoffs and come talk to us again. Thanks a lot. I appreciate you having me, and I'll be back for sure. All right. Take care. Thanks so much to Draymond Green, and thanks to Stamps.com. Remember, sign up for Stamps.com. Use my promo code BS, and you get a special offer that includes a four-week trial and a $110 bonus offer that includes postage and a digital scale. Click on the microphone at the top of the homepage. Type in BS. Stamps.com. And also thanks to Simply Safe. Remember, security systems deter burglars. You want to deter burglars. Try Simply Safe. Their 24-7 monitoring is just $14.99 a month. They'll never lock you into a long-term contract. You even get a 60-day money-back guarantee. Go with the only home security I trust, Simply Safe. Go to simplysafebill.com to save an extra 10%. Thanks to HBO Now, the home of the After the Thrones video podcast coming the night of April 24th. Just a, just a stone's throw after the Game of Thrones premiere on HBO. And thanks to TheRinger.com. Check out our newsletter. Sign up for it at TheRinger.com. Follow us at Twitter, at TheRinger. No, at Ringer. I can't even remember my own Twitter. It's at Ringer. Follow us at Ringer. Snapchat, at Ringer. Facebook. What is it? What's the Facebook date? Yeah, facebook.com slash ringer. All this stuff's really easy to remember. And uh, I have a special surprise for you. Coming back tomorrow with one more podcast. We're going to do a little playoff NBA preview. 
with our old friend, Haralabob Valgaris. He has some opinions. I look forward to hearing them. See you tomorrow. Anytime y'all want to see me again, rewind this track right here, close your eyes, and picture me rolling.